How's it going and welcome to No Fun Lads Guide Series on Candlekeep Mysteries, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be taking a look at a deep and creeping darkness. This scary book has it all in regards of the scary stuff. So of course players don't watch this, but DMs that want added insight on running this adventure by someone who's ran this, go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to cover. So here we are, the book A Deep and Creeping Darkness. This book found its way to Candlekeep by way of being handed down. An adventurer's grandparent wrote this thing ages ago and it's been sitting here ever since. This book details out the events that took place in Vermeilon. The town had a mining accident and a whole bunch of people died, but soon afterward, several people disappeared. The remaining villagers left and this has now been a sitting mystery for quite some time, 70 years in fact and there is still no one that knows what's going on. For Quest Oaks here, we have your players have been hired by a mining guild that wishes to reopen the mine, in which case your players are sent to Candlekeep to go ahead and find out any information they can about the town. Other possible adventure hooks could be your players are just simply interested in local history, legends and lore, the mining industry, and the unexplained disappearances of individuals and entire settlements. To sum all the events that took place in this town, a terrible tragedy took place. An explosion happened in the mine, killing a bunch of people and trapping a few more. Over the course of a few days, some people were able to escape, but others also perished. This was a terrible tragedy, and even more so, this terrible tragedy brought with it mean locks that spawned out of the Fey. These mean locks then started to prey upon the poor and distraught citizens, and more and more people started disappearing, and that is when the majority of the people that were still left in town decided to leave. The events that took place here happened 70 years ago, and as we'll be getting to later on, the only people that your players are going to interact with that have been to that town are humans, so they are pretty old. So with the incentive of an adventure, whether your players are doing it purely for the money or because they are genuinely curious, they start making their way to that village. Before they can reach the town of Vermelon, they must go to the town of Marin. And in the town of Marin, your players will be able to meet two individuals that used to live in the missing town. The first person that we can meet is Lucas Grosvenor. This guy was 20 years old when the events took place, and unfortunately, his wife was part of the mine, and his wife died. The interesting thing about this character is that he left after the explosion, but before the disappearances took place. Of course, that terrible tragedy has stayed with him all this time, but the cool thing about this is he will go ahead and give your players a quest if they go ahead and announce themselves that they are going to the town. He asks for two things. One, he wants flowers placed on his wife's grave, and secondly, he wants a necklace removed from a tree that is located in the center of town. This is a great way to get your players to explore around the town once they arrive, and of course, another great way to potentially get them into some trouble. And what's really interesting here is, even though these characters only come up for a brief moment, we actually get incredible detail on them. As for here, we get this whole backstory on this character, and we also get personality trait, ideal bond, and flaw. I love that when NPCs are fleshed out to this degree. Now, Ostra Vorn is 78 years old. They were pretty young when this took place. However, they can go ahead and tell the party that, oh yeah, we started leaving once my mom started having nightmares after the explosion. And that can start cluing them in on what's going on here. They're probably not going to get the full picture yet, but that'll go ahead and tie in greatly later on. The road to Vermelon takes three days by a horse to get there, so you can go ahead and flesh this out as you desire. It makes sense that there is no guards up there because the place has been abandoned, so you can go ahead and choose to have any random encounter should you desire. Me personally, if I'm running a one-shot, I'm not going to go ahead and bog things down with some unnecessary combats. And here it is, the town of Vermelon. Once your players arrive, they can see that this place is eerily quiet, as it should be because no one lives here. But here is where we get the immense detail. Six mean locks are currently calling this place their domain. Three mean locks are always staying within the mine, and the other three are chilling around in this town here, waiting for people to prey upon. This is where you can start seeding the adventure in. Don't have the mean locks just pop up and do combat because that's boring. Have the mean locks slowly creep up on them over time. Have them looking around the corners, and go ahead and use all these bullet points right here. Have people see their shadows begin to flicker. Have a voice whisper on the wind. Have these things go over time because the longer you can have this buildup, the better payoff it's going to be. And for some reason, if your players decide to sleep within the village, then the mean locks will go ahead and try to influence their nightmares. Once they finish a long rest, they must make a DC 13 wisdom saving throw or gain one level of exhaustion. 
So for playing up these mean locks, don't play them up as stupid. They're not just going to show up in the middle of daylight and attack the party. No, that doesn't make any sense, especially if they're well armed. At most, they'll go ahead and attack a single person if your party splits up. But if your party doesn't split up, then the mean locks are never going to attack. They're just constantly going to go ahead and try and sow fear and paranoia into their minds. Now, of course, this is where a lot of DMs and groups are going to defer. If you're running for a group that likes to get into combat, then sure, go ahead and start throwing out more combats. But if you just want this to be a scary sort of situation, then don't have them ever attack at all until they get to the mines, until that grand finale. So for places of interest around here, we get five locations in the town that your players will be able to visit. And while your players explore around, go ahead and tell them all the sights and sounds that they're seeing and hearing. Make sure that they feel like this place has been abandoned for years because it has been. For Area 1, the Wand and Hammer, should your players decide to explore around this place, they could potentially be able to find some pretty cool stuff. They can find a decent amount of gold worth of items, but also a ring of swimming. Pretty cool. There is no swimming in this adventure, but hey, maybe that'll be useful in adventure later down the line. In Area 2, we have the Stonemason's Workshop. When your players look around in here, they'll be able to see a half-finished headstone, and that tells something, right? The fact that in the middle of work, they decide to either leave the town or maybe something bad happened to them. In Area 3, we have the Mayor's Office. We get a whole section dedicated to that, so we'll be looking at that in a moment. In Area 4, we have the Tree. If your players arrive here and they've talked to Lucas, then they can go ahead and immediately search around and find what they are looking for. A pendant on a thin chain. Inscribed on this pendant is For Lorna Forever. That's pretty cute. Your players grab this and then they can go ahead and bring it back to Lucas when the adventure is over. Of course, if your players didn't talk to Lucas and they're just exploring around, then they need to pass a DC-15 investigation check in order to find it. In Area 5, the Graveyard, when your players walk in here, I would strongly suggest that... As your players look around, they immediately notice that all of the headstones have a similar date. That'll go ahead and emphasize that the majority of these people died at the same time. However, you should specifically date several people after that. They just simply disappeared. Should your players decide to drop some flowers off at Lucas's wife's grave, which, by the way, if they look around anywhere, they can find flowers. This place has been abandoned, so undoubtedly there's flowers just growing around all over the place. They drop these flowers off and they will hear a soft, contented sigh on the wind. I would recommend that you don't play this up to be scary or creepy. In fact, I actually would reward some inspiration or something of that regard should they go out of their way to do this. In Area 6, we have the Merchant's Cart. Your players explore around here and they can make some survival or investigation checks and they'll be able to understand some pretty important information here. The fact that this cart has not been sitting here for 70 years. In fact, it's only been sitting here for one. And also, very importantly, is your players look at this thing, and they can definitely tell this wasn't robbers because they would have just stolen everything, right? The fact that there's still items here of worthwhile and value, and even gold itself, that tells you that these things are monsters, not humanoids. And here we get even more information on running the mean locks. Like I said before, take your time with this thing. The mean locks are going to slowly unnerve the party until they break, until they reach that sense of paranoia. And that is when they're going to strike. And mind you, if at any time anybody breaks off on their own far enough away, the mean locks will go ahead and strike. But here's the important thing. Mean locks do not strike to kill. When they drop someone, they're going to go ahead and grab them and take them back to the mine. And when they take them back to the mine, they're going to start beginning the process of transforming them into a mean lock. And now we get not only a map, but also some great information on the mayor's house. Mayor Lay Duvazine was taken in the night and transformed into a mean lock. And in fact, she is one of the mean locks still here. The interesting thing is, even while as a mean lock, they have a signet ring upon their finger. So if there is a combat that takes place and the mean lock that is the mayor is killed, then they'll be able to see that signet ring there and they can go ahead and connect the dots. So the mayor's house itself, the majority of the rooms are just fluff, but you should go ahead and seat in that paranoia once again. The flickering of the shadows, the whispers, the faint noises, the scratching, the clawing. You should go ahead and have it be that the players are guessing every which way what is going on, where is the enemy, what are we doing here. Exploring around this place on the first floor isn't going to net them too much knowledge, but on the second floor they can get some really great information. In Area 8, we have the Master Bedroom. Your players can find a journal there from the mayor, and she details out how after the explosion people went missing, and she stubbornly stayed behind but sent her wife and kids away. In Area 9, the library, that is where everything is spilled. 
this is where your players can learn that the creatures are in fact mean locks and these mean locks are sowing the fear and the paranoia and all that terrible stuff so the thing with this is if you're running a mystery adventure then this goes ahead and just reveals everything and then it becomes a okay we're gonna go down there and we're gonna go ahead and challenge this so do you want to keep up the mystery i would say if you want to keep up the mystery then you can go ahead and just remove the term mean lock here and just have it be creatures so they don't know what they're going up against with all the information that they gathered and or the quest that they have to go ahead and clear this place out your players are going to make their way to the mine and that is when the real scary stuff is going to happen so what I'm going to go ahead and say is, yes, we do get this map, but me personally, I find that not having a map makes things much more scary. If your players don't know where they're going, you can just go ahead and say that they can make their own map, or you can just describe as they go down winding paths. But I would strongly recommend not showing them a map because then they're going to know the confines of the space. And without further ado, let's go ahead and start looking at all the locations in the cave. In area one, the main tunnel, when your players make their way into the cave, you're going to have them roll a DC 14 wisdom saving throw. If they fail, then they're going to have disadvantage on intelligence and wisdom checks because they're constantly being distracted by whispers and shifting movement and all that. And that's a big deal because if you are having it where they have to make some sort of check in order to find where they are, they're going to be distracted. And that's a huge deal. In area two, we have the southern wing. Your players make their way inside of here looking around trying to find any way through the cave. And unfortunately, they will be attacked by a swarm of bats. And you should go ahead and stress that normally swarms of bats don't attack random people. But these swarms of bats will. They'll attack anybody that's not a mean lock. And that's kind of scary, really. These random creatures are being driven to attacking. In area three, northern wing, really nothing fancy going on here. In area four, we have the cave-in. I would strongly emphasize that your players cannot get past you at all whatsoever. But if they try, and you specifically use the word, an impenetrable wall of earth, and your players constantly try, then of course just have them keep on making those dexterity saving throws or take damage. And I promise you at some point they're going to learn that they cannot pass. In area 5 we have the entrance to the mean lock lair. Your players make their way inside of here and they can see that these walls are not natural. If your players make a DC 14 arcana or nature check, they can reveal that these things were not created by hand, claw, or tool, but rather by magic. If the check succeeds by four or more, meaning an 18 or higher, then they can discover, yes, that mean locks created these moss covered tunnels. But if they don't know what mean locks are, I would go ahead and strongly emphasize that these things were created by some magical entity unknown to them. In Area 6, the Chamber of Weeping, anybody that makes their way inside of here has to make a DC 14 dexterity saving throw or be grappled by the black moss along the walls. So if the whole party is conjoined at the hip, this isn't that big of a deal. But if that paranoia is seeding into the PCs and they split up, this is a big deal because if anybody gets grappled here, then a mean lock's just going to come up and shank them. And that's really bad. In Area 7, we have the Mossy Maze. As your players are making their way through all this area, go ahead and describe to them that they see something around the corner, that they hear someone calling out for help. Go ahead and have them exploring around this place, and finally they're going to realize that either they're insane or this place is insane. In Area 8, we have the Pools. This is a connection to the Feywild, but more importantly, there is a Black Pudding here, and this is a very low-level adventure. A Black Pudding is absolutely disastrous. If anybody makes their way inside of here and they get ganked by a Black Pudding, that could theoretically be a dead PC, or at the very least, a destroyed set of weapons and armor. Pretty bad. We actually get some cool information here about the Feywild Crossing, that if your players show up here on a full moon night and submerge, then they will appear in the Feywild. Of course, we get no information about the Feywild in this adventure, but hey, this could lead into your own Feywild campaign. In Area 9, we have the Transformation Center. Your players arrive in here and they'll be able to look around and see these slabs that have dry blood on it and they'll be able to see these natural pillars. Once your players make their way to the center of this room, any remaining mean locks are going to go ahead and emerge. I would go ahead and describe it as they coalesce out of the shadows and make sure that the mean locks come from all directions and prevent anybody from escaping here. The dynamic part about this combat encounter is the fact that there's all these stone pillars and slabs, the fact that the mean locks can come from every direction and make sure that they cannot escape on foot, and also the fact that there is a dynamite trap here. The mean locks are going to go ahead and trigger these things as a last resort. If a mean lock starts its turn with 10 HP or fewer, it moves to the nearest trigger, goes ahead and pulls it, and then is going to shadow teleport away, and then the explosion is going to ring out. Any creature within 5 feet of an exploding dynamite 
must make a DC 12 dexterity saving throw or take 3d6 bludgeoning damage. And hey, that'll add up if they get hit by multiple dynamites and or get hit by several meanlock claws. The real big thing here is, yes, that's a fun gimmick one time, but here's the thing. Once all four are blown away, then that is the bad news bears. Once the fourth stone pillar has collapsed, each creature in the cavern must make a DC 15 dexterity saving throw or take 4d10 points of bludgeoning damage. If they fail, they take the damage, they fall prone, and are restrained in the rubble. On a success, you're going to take half the damage and not fall prone. Trying to wrestle yourself out of the rubble is going to require a DC 20 athletics check. So this is a very dynamic combat encounter, and I would strongly recommend that you go ahead and tailor this depending on how many PCs you have and how strong they are. If you have all six mean locks that are still left in the village attack, that could prove disastrous if there's only three PCs in the party, let's say. So go ahead and temper this to your own campaign, but I strongly recommend that you have these natural hazards. If your players don't spend the time looking around and scrutinizing everything, and they don't see the dynamite charges, then yeah, they're going to be surprised when that first one happens. But guess what? Once you do that first one, then immediately they should recognize, okay, this happened one time, it's probably going to happen again. And if they go ahead and cut a fuse, that's a big deal. They only need to cut one fuse to make sure that there is no cave-in, which is probably pretty good because if they have a cave-in, that could be an easy TPK. If your players are successful in destroying the mean locks here and not having this place cave in, then your players can search around and find all the old remains. Looking around, they can find all of the clothes of all of the poor people that transformed into mean locks, and they'll also be able to find some cool swag, including some gold items and also goggles of the night. So hopefully your players are successful in cutting at least one of the dynamite triggers, and then they can go ahead and loot the place once the mean locks are dead. But if your players are not successful in that case, then they do lose out on some swag. And something I strongly would recommend is to have a more dynamic ending to this one shot. You could have it where the whole cave is collapsing after all the dynamite is used. And you can go ahead and have a fun encounter where your players are running out and potentially being harried by the mean locks along the way. And another, another thing is, if you aren't using the map to explore around, that could be a big deal because if they don't know which way they came from, then they could theoretically get lost in here for quite some time. And for wrapping up this cute little one-shot, we have the fate of Vermelon. If your players are successful in killing all of the mean locks, then your players can go ahead and report this and the town will flourish once again as people repopulate this place and the mine reopens. Businesses will flourish and your players will be treated like heroes in this location. But if your players are unsuccessful in destroying all of the mean locks, then people continue to disappear through this dead and vacant town. And even more terrifying, at some point, the number of mean locks that grow from this town eventually will be threatening to the town of Marin nearby. So, hopefully your players deal with them all, and if they do, great, but if they don't deal with them all, then eventually it's going to become a problem later down the line. So all in all, I like this one shot. It is very cute, it is well rounded, your players go to a location, there's a mystery afoot, there's some scary stuff going down, and then you can either have the combat spread out over time, or just have it be one awesome epic dynamic encounter near the end. They get to learn about this town's history, they get to inquire about some of its people, and eventually they can go ahead and help out this town by restoring it to its former glory. This adventure hits up the exploration and combat pillars of D&D extremely well, and depending on how much your players interact with the town of Marin, then of course you have that roleplay pillar as well. This is an easy one-shot to run, you're not having to memorize too many things, a lot of it is just read off the script and it works perfectly, and of course you can go ahead and have things peter out over time, and this fits extremely well if you run it as a one and a half hour one-shot, or even up all the way to a four or five, maybe even six hour one-shot, it works well. Of course, it can also be easily fitted into any campaign, so long as the campaign has a town that could reasonably be anywhere. This adventure fits extremely well anywhere you wish to put it. So my overall recommendation is that this thing is awesome and I strongly recommend that you run it. I've had a blast running it and I can't wait to run it some more. But that is going to do it for me. Go ahead and tell me, do you plan on running this adventure as is or are you going to go ahead and shake things up a bit? Are you going to run it as a one shot or add it to a pre-existing campaign? Or maybe you're going to make it a multi-shot. Go ahead and tell me all of those things because I want to know. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you to all my amazing patrons up here. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for listening. 
and I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.